welcome everyone to the lecture series on uh, lecture series considering earth science week 2021 the lecture series is on from 10th to 16th of october 2021 it is organized by maharashtra vruksha samvardhini mission devrai and in association with ferguson college pune navroz ji wadia college pune seo as goa university today is october the 13th 2021 and it is fourth day talk on dinosaurs the magnificent and the bizarre the talk will be given by mr vikram vakil from australia so here i take pleasure to introduce you to vikram vakil he has started his academic journey at ferguson college pune he has done his uh, bachelor of science from ferguson college pune and we all know him as a very passionate and focused student since then so he pursued uh, his career further going in australia and he has completed his bsc as well as msc in vertebrate paleontology as a branch of geology at the university of queensland australia currently he is working towards his doctoral research at the queensland on vertebrate paleontology under dr price and professor webb he has two research papers to his credit he mainly works on geochemistry of dinosaur bones and taxonomic importance of plesiosaurian and ichthyopterygian vertebrae so i warmly welcome you vikram for uh, the fourth talk uh, on earth science week and Thank i you. welcome all the guests and the listeners students teachers to this event so vikram the stage is yours Sure. Thank you me. very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so, um, sorry, is my uh, screen visible, sir? Yes. Okay. It's the last page. Haha. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So, um, good yes. afternoon, uh, everybody, or good evening, as per the Indian time. Uh, my name is Vikram, and uh, today I'll be talking about dinosaurs, the magnificent and the bizarre. So. what i want to talk about in this presentation is how our view of dinosaurs has changed over time what we once saw them as and how that view has evolved over time so these are the different uh, topics that i will be covering in today's talk so i'll be talking about the etymology so what exactly means by the term dinosaur and a brief historical context would be given and i'll be talking a little bit about amniotes and the ancestors of dinosaurs because remember we are talking here about a group of animals so we can't just jump into a particular topic and start talking about it we need to have some sort of context some sort of background information as to where these animals fit in the bigger picture that is where they fit in in the tree of life so i'll be talking a little bit about the ancestors of dinosaurs then once i get into the topic of dinosaurs i'll mention a little bit about evolution how dinosaurs have evolved through time and a little bit uh, about their diversity so i'll be covering the main groups the main major groups of dinosaurs but of course i won't go into a uh, tremendous detail in each of those groups because otherwise i'll be exceeding the time by a very very large amount and then of course i'll also be talking about the extinction event and we'll see together whether or not the dinosaurs have gone completely extinct or are they still with us today and then i'll also briefly mention about how we are constantly working towards bringing them back to life and when i say bringing them back to life i am not talking about the jurassic park scenario i'm talking about how we are constantly achieving our goal of scientifically bringing them back to life and lastly i will talk about some recent advancements that have taken place over the past decades that have actually changed our perception of what these animals were and are so first like i said i'll be giving you a little bit about the historical uh, background on dinosaurs 
So the term dinosauria was actually coined by the British comparative anatomist, Sir Richard Oven in 1842. The name literally translates to terrible lizards, dinos meaning terrible and soria, sor meaning lizards or reptiles. So dinosaurs at the time when they were found by Sir Richard Oven, they were literally viewed as gigantic lizards. They were viewed, uh, Sir Richard Oven did get one thing right about dinosaurs. And that is the fact that these are extinct animals. They are animals unlike anything that were present or that are present today. And the other thing that he got right about the dinosaurs was, as we shall see, the position of the leg bones of the dinosaur. So dinosaurs are easily differentiated from lizards, from your modern day lizards, by having legs that are tucked directly underneath the body. If you observe a modern day lizard, you will notice that the lizard tends to sprawl, sprawl out its legs, but a dinosaur would have its legs tucked directly underneath the body. But at the same time, Sir Richard Oven was an ardent opposer of Darwin's evolutionary theory by natural selection. He opposed it fervently in his later on years to uh, by the time Sir Richard Oven uh, got old, uh, he began to accept some parts of the evolutionary theory, but he was still under the assumption that man or humankind in general was exempt from this theory, that the theory of evolution did not apply to humans. So that was pretty much Sir Richard Evans logic towards his later years. However, in his heyday, he was pretty much opposed to the theory of evolution. He followed a uh, lineus's systema naturae, that's the taxonomic hierarchy, wherein lineus, Carolus lineus, he laid down this uh, particular uh, hierarchy of animal classification, wherein he put what he considered to be lowly forms or low living forms like reptiles and amphibians at the bottom. And the ladder went like successively and at the top, was man. So according to him, and this was before the theory of evolution was actually proposed. So Sir Richard Oven was an ardent supporter of uh, Linnaeus's taxonomic hierarchy uh, of animals. So he viewed, like, despite getting right the fact that dinosaurs were separate, dinosaurs were unlike anything that we have ever seen, he pretty much viewed them as low living forms. And this is reflected in some of his work because he hired this guy, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was actually a sculptor. He was a sculptor known for carving stone figures. So he hired this guy to, con to reconstruct or to sculpt out dinosaurs as he perceived it. So Sir Richard Evan had, like I said, a very reptilian idea of what dinosaurs might have looked like. And you can see that in this reconstruction, which is, by the way, the collection of models at Crystal Palace in Sindenham. This was the first time that the concept of dinosaurs was actually open to the public in general. And this was based on the latest scientific consensus back then. So Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, under the scientific supervision of Sir Richard Evans, uh, built these dinosaurs. And this is the famous dinosaur dinner party. So as soon as uh, the concept of dinosaurs was open to the public, as soon as they began to visit the Crystal Palace in London and they began to see all these uh, gigantic sculptures, uh, Sir Richard Oven held a dinner party inside one of the sculptures, which was sculpted by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. And he invited a lot of guests. Amongst them were the famous geologist uh, William Buckland and also the French um, uh, comparative anatomist, uh, Baron Georges Cuvier. This is another thing. So as dinosaur study began to advance in the succeeding years, so Sir Richard Oven made it very famous, made the concept of dinosaurs popular and famous amongst public. And as the study advanced, people began to get more and more interested. And this resulted in this one particular period, which is referred to as the bone wars. Now, bone wars is important from a historical perspective, and it, in my opinion, I would say it is also something that needs to be remembered as a lesson, as a lesson which is not supposed to be repeated. The bone wars occurred between two people. On the left-hand side, this person was Othniel Charles Marsh. On the right-hand side, this person was Edward Drinker Cope. Both were scientists. Both started out on a very friendly basis. They were on amicable terms with each other. They were even friends up to a certain extent, you can say, because each of them would actually name some of the other species of the animals that they were studying, but like in honor of the other person. 
But there came a time when bitter rivalry ensued between the two. So the story goes that Othniel Charles Marsh once pointed to Edward Drinker Cope that one of his skeletons, and this was actually the skeleton of an extinct marine reptile called Elasmosaurus. Today we know the genus as Elasmosaurus platyurus, that's the species. So he pointed to Edward Drinker Cope that, look, your skeleton that you're having of Elasmosaurus, it's all fine, but you have put the skull on the wrong end of the body. So instead of putting the skull on the neck end, you have by mistake put it on the tail end. And this should have been taken by Edward Drinker Cope in a positive light. It should have been because it was a genuine thing that Othniel Charles Marsh was trying to point out. However, Edward Drinker Cope took it negatively. And since then, bitter rivalry ensued amongst the two. And ever since, the two of them had been on completely opposite terms with each other. The moment Edward Drinker Cope would, co would come out with a paper, Othniel Charles Marsh would come out with his paper. He would be uh, in a sort of counter argumentative uh, mood in order to criticize what Cope had done and vice versa. And, you know, it went on for a very long time. So as a result, what suffered was science. Because what they were doing now was just having some sort of personal vendetta against each other. They were not doing real science. And this was realized years later after their deaths, when people began to actually revise all the literature and all the previously published works, they realized that towards their later on years, while the two of them were so-called bitter rivals of each other, they were really not doing science. Most of the stuff that, had, that they had published was also wrong. So this is, in my opinion, a lesson to be learned as well, that you're not supposed to do this in science, that when someone is having some evidence in his or her favor, and if they are trying to point it out to you, accept it positively. That's called accepting constructive criticism. So the bone wars is important from a historical perspective while talking about the dinosaurs and also serves as a good lesson for us. So now coming back to our main topic. So that was, like I said, a very brief historical overview. Uh, dinosaurs. So dinosaurs lived during the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic era is one of the time periods in Earth's history. So Mesozoic era in turn comprises of three periods. You've got the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. The Triassic lasted from 252 to 201 million years ago, Jurassic from 201 to 145, and Cretaceous from 145 to 66. Remember, when we are talking about the geological age of any particular period or any particular fossil or anything in, you know, uh, anything in particular, it's always better to give the name. Like, it's always better to say that dinosaurs lived during the Triassic period, during the Jurassic, during the Cretaceous, rather than just giving the age range, because the age range is something that changes all the time. For instance, you will see that most of the books and most of the textbooks that are published on dinosaurs, they will say that dinosaurs died out around 65 million years ago. But today, we definitively know that the boundary was at least six at 66 million years ago. So like I said, it's always better to give the name instead of just the range. And yes, so Mesozoic era is one of the three eras of our uh, Earth's history. So we had the Paleozoic era, like in the new life, we have we had the Paleozoic era, which comprised from Cambrian right to the uh, Permian. Then we had the Mesozoic or the middle life, as it was called. And it was from the Triassic to the Cretaceous. And then today, what we are living in is called the Cenozoic. Cenozoic in turn comprises of two periods, tertiary and quaternary. We are in the quaternary period. So like I said, this is going to be a little bit... <laughs> Uh, this is going to be a little bit like a very short narrative kind of a thing. So before I just jump into dinosaurs and talk about what dinosaurs are, the different kinds of dinosaurs, like I said, I'll give you a little bit of context. So this is the context, like part one. So adapting to life on land, we know that life evolved in water. So the very first life that actually evolved, the vertebrates, the chordates, and the subsequent vertebrates, they evolved in water. Then life began to move onto land. So you have a certain group of vertebrates which can be considered as one of those intermediate forms between the water dwelling vertebrates and the earliest tetrapods, that is the animals that were beginning to move onto land. We have a few representative fossils like Ichthyostega, Acanthostega. These are the so-called intermediate ancestors. The, now, if you're moving onto land, you're moving into another realm altogether. So you need to face some challenges 
One of them, of course, is breathing, because in water you are using your gills to breathe, whereas on land you need lungs. So your lungs need to become more and more strong as you are moving or as you are transitioning onto land. There are two ways in which you can use the breathing strategy on land. One is called buckle pumping, and I'll play this video. There are one or two short videos throughout the slides, which I will play as long as, I mean, um, while I'm still talking, and they don't have audio, so don't worry about it. So one is called buckle pumping. So buckle pumping is a means by which some primitive tetrapods breathe it, and frogs and salamanders and all your amphibians still do today. Not so much salamanders, but frogs and toads still do today. So what happens in buckle pumping is that air is sucked into the mouth, then the mouth is closed. And once the mouth is closed, the floor of the mouth is raised. So if the floor of the mouth is raised and the mouth is closed, all that air that you had sucked in gets automatically pushed down the lungs. And that's how you breathe. Frogs tend to breathe in that way. The other method is called costal ventilation, wherein the ribs and the muscles around the ribs, that's called the costal muscles, they expand and contract. And of course, if you are adapting to life on land, apart from respiration, you also need to evolve a neck because when you're in the water, a neck is not so much uh, important because you can have lateral or side to side undulations, which is why the primitive vertebrates, which were still pretty much aquatic or you know, who, who, the ones who lived in water, they didn't have a well-defined neck. They had a region which we call the branchial region, but the moment the first tetrapods evolved onto land, they needed to have a well-defined neck in order for the head to move from one side to the other. You also needed to develop well-defined limbs because in the water you use fins, but when you're moving onto land, your limbs need to be strong. And if your limbs are going to be strong, naturally the vertebral region and the muscular region around the vertebrae are also going to be strong. And finally, you needed to develop cladoic eggs. Now, what do I mean by cladoic eggs? Cladoic eggs are those eggs which don't have to worry about getting desiccated or drying out because the earliest tetrapods and even amphibians today, they lay their eggs in water because if they don't lay their eggs in water, if they lay their eggs on land, the eggs dry out and the embryo will die. So the first animals which were going to be completely adapted to a terrestrial lifestyle, amphibians, remember, they live part of their life on land, part in water. But first, uh, amniotes, like the very first earliest reptiles, and subsequently mammals and birds and everybody else, all the other vertebrates, they needed to adapt to a life which was completely terrestrial. So they needed to have eggs which wouldn't dry out, and that's called clitoic eggs. And this took place somewhere in the Devonian. This, uh, uh, what you say, transition took place in the Devonian. And what were the major advancements in the amniotes? First, what is an amniote? An amniote is that tetrapod, which is beginning to have a completely terrestrial lifestyle, which is about to move away and away and away from the water. As I said, it needed to have a cladoic egg. The eggs didn't need to be laid in water. And now if the eggs are not going to be laid in water, you don't need to pass through an aquatic or a larval stage. The reason why amphibians have this tadpole stage is because the eggs are laid in water. So the very first environment that the animal encounters as soon as it hatches from the egg is the water. It needs to be able to swim in the water, otherwise it's going to die. But if your eggs are going to be laid on land, the very environment you're going to encounter upon hatching is the land itself. So you do not need to pass through the aquatic or the larval stage. And Yes, during the Mesozoic, you had dinosaurs, but apart from the dinosaurs, you also had other groups of animals. That's why whenever you pick up a book on dinosaurs, it almost always says dinosaurs and other prehistoric life. That other prehistoric life or the other prehistoric reptiles include a couple of groups, some of which I'll just briefly mention here. One was the group called Mesozoic marine reptiles. Now, their origin took place contemporaneously, and that's about the same time as the dinosaurs in the Triassic. And they are said to evolve from a uriapsid ancestor. Uriapsids are nothing but like a very particular type of amniotes, which are distinguished on the basis of their skull morphology. So they just have one pair of holes, one pair of skull holes on the top of their heads, which we call the supratemporal fenestrae. And uh, the Mesozoic marine reptiles included many groups. We have the ichthyosaurs, that's um, this group over here, which fall under a category called ichthyoterygia. Then we've got all these other three groups, that's placodons, plesiosaurs, and pliosaurs, which on the whole, along with another group called nothosaurs, come under 
plesiosauria. So the mesozoic marine reptiles are divided into two groups, plesiosauria and ichthyosauria. And the key thing to remember over here is that they are not dinosaurs. They are just lizards. They, um, they're not exactly lizards. They're just other reptiles that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs. And this photo over here, this black and white photo over here, uh, photo over here some of you might have recognized it's a Loch Ness monster. And uh, this, like over the years, obviously it has been proven to be a fake, but this was actually an inspiration from the plesiosaur. So we already had plesiosaur fossils, which were found way back in the 19th century. And this was an inspiration drawn from that. And like I said, they are not dinosaurs. So now we come to, so plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, as I said, they belong to a particular type of uh, amniote uh, called the uriapsid. The uriapsids went completely extinct. They have left no living descendants. Now we come to another group called the diapsids. The diapsids today include lizards and snakes. It also includes a very particular group of animals called tuateras, which are found mainly only in New Zealand. They are endemic to New Zealand at the moment. And we also have other groups like crocodiles and birds. So crocodiles and birds are also your diapsids, which are alive today. But on the whole, if I'm to give you an evolutionary picture of the diapsid, I would say there is, uh, I'll just, yeah, there was an ancestral diapsid over here. That was the most common recent ancestor of all the diapsids. One branch gave rise to your lizards and snakes and tuateras, which come under lepidosaurs. We're not concerned about them right now, which is why I have made the line dotted. We're concerned about this line, the line that gave rise to crocodiles and pterosaurs and dinosaurs and also birds, as we shall see. So this line is called the archosaur line. So crocodiles, pterosaurs, dinosaurs and birds are archosaurs. And diapsids in general are characterized by a a very peculiar skull condition. So remember how in uriapsids, you just had one pair of holes on the top. That was the supratemporal fenestrae. In diapsids, you've got two pairs of holes. So you've got your supratemporal fenestrae on top of the skull, and you've got holes at the sides of the skull as well, which we call the lateral temporal fenestrae. Dinosaurs, crocodiles, and birds, and pterosaurs, like I said, they come under archosaurs. Archosaurs had one extra pair of holes in front of the mouth in front, uh, like, you know, on the snout region as well, which is called the ant orbital fenestra. Lizards and snakes don't have the ant orbital fenestra. So archosaurs are more specialized or more derived diapsids. In birds, that ant orbital fenestra, in up to a certain extent, has been closed, but it has been secondarily lost. So the ancestors had it. And in the skies, you had flying animals as well, like pterosaurs. Like if I, when I showed you this diagram, I said that pterosaurs over here, they are also diapsids. But as you can see, pterosaurs again are not dinosaurs. Pterosaurs form a sister taxa to dinosaurs. So it means that pterosaurs and dinosaurs share a common ancestor, which in time diverged from, you know, it, it diverged and gave rise to the two branches that we see, pterosauria and dinosauria. Together, pterosaurs and dinosaurs comprise a higher group called Ornithodira. So pterosaurs were the masters of the skies. Again, their evolution or their origin was contemporaneous with the dinosaurs, that is in the Triassic period. The name pterosaur, I will also play this video as I'm talking, literally translates to winged reptiles. So they evolved during the Triassic, emerged during the Triassic, died out along with the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. We know pterosaurs from at least 110 species today. So it's a very diverse group of animals. They have some unique characteristics, like they have a short body, they've got five long toes. But what's very important or what's very conspicuous about the pterosaurs is the fact that they have these long wings and the wings are pretty much like a bat. It's like a patagium. What do I mean by that? So if you are to imagine a bat, a bat has a wing that extends between the fore limbs and the hind limbs. So did the pterosaurs. But the key difference between pterosaurs and bats as proposed by some people is in their mode of flight. Bats are active flapping flyers. So they have strong chest muscles, strong flight muscles like your pectoralis muscles, which aid them in flapping flight. So the more they flap, the more they are able to generate the thrust to lift themselves off the ground. So that is called active flying. 
terror sauce, it has been presumed or some, or at least one school of thought says that flight may have been passive. So all that they had to do, they didn't have very strong muscles apparently because the muscle uh, attachment sites in some of them were really, really very weak. So all that they had to do was just stretch out their wings, like, you know, in the direction of the wind and the wind itself would just lift them up. Now you would think if they are so big, if they, if these are like, these were, by the way, literally big animals about the size of a small uh, glider plane. So if they are so big, how was the wind sufficient enough to actually lift them off the ground? Well, we do know that pterosaur bones happen to be one of the lightest bones ever known. Why? Because their bones are hollow. They are traversed by canals and air sacs called uh, trabeculae, because of which the overall bone density was very light. And that could have aided in passive flying pterosaurs. And on the land, you had archosaurs. And uh, uh, the land archosaurs, of course, were your crocodiles and all the ancestors of crocodiles and the ancestors of the first dinosaurs as well. These were all terrestrial. And of course, you also had um, lizards, but like I said, lizards and tuatras were your lepidosaurs. They are different from archosaurs. So one key difference between most of the earliest archosaurs and the lizards and tuatras and the line that gave rise to your dinosaurs eventually is the fact that, as I mentioned, the posture, the limb posture, in the case of dinosaurs and birds and even mammals, although mammals have a completely different ancestry, the legs are held directly underneath the body. We don't have the sprawling posture. And where do dinos or the dinosaurs fit in this big uh, tree of life? So first over here, you've got the an ancestral amniote. It gave rise to uriapsids that we saw over here, the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. They have left no living descendants. On the other hand, they gave rise to synapsids. Now, synapsids include the earliest ancestors of mammals and all their descendants, which is mammals. That's us. We are technically speaking synapsids, but our our synapsid condition is a very derived condition. Again, what is a synapsid condition? It's just a skull condition based on certain kinds of holes in the skull. So we're not concerned about synapsids over here. We are concerned about this particular group called the diapsids. Again, we're not concerned with lizards and snakes. We're only concerned with the archosaurs, specifically the dinosaurs, which fall over here, and the birds. So the earliest dinosaurs, uh, the earliest ancestors of dinosaurs are called dinosauromorphs. Some people also use the term dinosauriforms. Sometimes these two terms are used synonymously, but if uh, if you are to refer to certain recent uh, research or recent cladistic analysis that has been done, you will realize that dinosaur forms were a more specialized group than the relatively primitive dinosauromorphs. So these are those particular animals which are more close to the dinosaur line than the crocodile line. So remember, archosaurs were divided into crocodile line and the dinosaur line. So the dinosauromorphs were more close evolutionary to the dinosaur line. One such example is Lager, sorry, Lagerpeton from Argentina. And as you can see, it is very primitive. It's almost a lizard-like, but it's got hind legs, which are longer than the front legs. So this indicates a bipedal posture. So this is like a, a, a pathway towards bipedality. And the age of true dinosaurs. Now, According to the current consensus, what is the definition of a dinosaur? Like I can give you a list of characters and I will show you those list of characters through which we can say that, okay, this animal is a dinosaur, but every organism or everything in science needs to have a clear cut definition. Today we do know, according to today's consensus, a dinosaur is nothing but the most common recent ancestor of a stegosaurus, a triceratops, a sparrow, and all their descendants, which includes all the other dinosaurs that you know, like T-Rex and sauropods and everybody. So as we are going to see, birds are not just the descendants of dinosaurs, birds are living dinosaurs. The scientific name for a bird is avian theropod. And there was one special, very specialized group of the dinosaurs called the Maniraptorans, which eventually gave rise to your birds, as we shall see. So what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? Like I said, I could give you a list of characters with, through which if I say that, okay, this bone has all these characters, check mark, check mark, check mark, therefore it's a dinosaur. So first, these are the characters over here. Uh, don't worry about what I've written over here. Uh, I would rather actually explain this through uh, some diagrams that I have shown you over here. So firstly, on the skull, you see this bone that has been marked jugal, 
the back part of it that is the posterior part of the jugal is in, in is in the shape of a fork like prong as you can see there is a top part that goes over here there is a bottom part that goes at the bottom and this receives another bone called this qj which means quadrato jugal so the jugal bone in dinosaurs always happens to have this fork like prongs and what it does is it just provides extra strength to that particular region of the skull then on the top you have something called the prf which is prefrontal on the top you've also got frontal these are just different bones on the top of the skull and then you've got po or the post orbital over here there is one particular bone which is present in other groups but which is not present in the dinosaurs it is called pf or the post frontal so prefrontal which is in front of the frontal post frontal which apparently should have been present at the back of the frontal bone is not present so there is no pf no post frontal bone then when you come to this particular thing uh, this diagram over here these are vertebrae as you can see these red arrows that have uh, been marked they point to small little bumps on these vertebrae so these are the neck vertebrae of of dinosaurs neck vertebrae are called cervical vertebrae and these bumps that you are seeing are epipophyses they are nothing but very tiny tiny bumps on the posterior part of the neck vertebrae but why is it so important dinosaurs are the only groups of animals that have epipophyses no other groups will ever have will ever show you epipophyses so for for if ever you have an isolated vertebra and you know it's a cervical vertebra but you don't know whether it's a reptile or an amphibian or which group of animals the moment you spot these bumps on the bones you can immediately say this is a dinosaur vertebra with certainty then when you come over here uh, at the bottom left below the skull you'll notice this is the upper arm bone this is called the humerus and this region which has been marked in red is that particular region of the humerus which is more close to the body which is more proximally placed this is called the deltopectoral crest in the case of dinosaurs the deltopectoral crest was elongated it was stretched out why for extra muscle attachment so an elongated deltopectoral crest is also a characteristic of dinosaurs and then you see this diagram over here complemented by the image this diagram is the lower part of the lower leg bone so your shank bone the lower leg this is called the tibia the tibia and the fibula the ti that has been marked is the tibia fi is the fibula and naturally this bottom you know this bulbous structure that you are seeing is the ankle bone this ankle bone has been marked as and ca as means astragalus ca means calcaneum these are two bones that comprise the ankle they are fused together in the case of dinosaurs into one solid unit and they comprise the ankle bone what's important about this ankle bone is that you see this ap that has been marked over here ap this ap stands for the ascending process of the astragalus so the astragalus has a vertical triangulated ascending process which abutes against the lower part of your tibia so this characteristic again is very important for dinosaurs then you come to the hip region this is the hip region this bone is the ilium this is the pubis this is the pubic boot and this is the ischium the hole that you are seeing over here is the hip socket this is the socket in which your leg bone actually fits in which your thigh bone or the femur bone actually fits this hip socket is called acetabulum as you can see it is open there is no bone or no shelf of any sort to prevent the uh, the the femur from getting inside the acetabulum so an open acetabular region is another characteristic feature that defines dinosaurs so um so i'll just move my uh, top bar a little bit okay so we are now on dinosaur diversity so dinosaurs are principally divided into two groups one or one is called order ornithischia i'm sorry what's yeah one is called order ornithischia or the bird hipped dinosaurs the other is order saurischia or the lizard hipped dinosaurs as the name suggests ornithischian dinosaurs had their hip bones more like that of a bird saurischians had their hip bones more like that of a lizard naturally if we are saying birds are dinosaurs your first intuition would be that birds have descended from the bird hipped dinosaurs but that's not the case birds have actually descended from the lizard hipped dinosaurs or the saurischians so yes birds are avian saurischian theropods or avian saurischians in general how do we know that we know that from embryological evidence of birds and uh, if like 
I can go into detail uh, if you want about the embryological factor of that, but uh, I'll leave that for the question part towards the end, if anyone's interested. So the ornithischian dinosaurs are principally divided into two main groups. One group is called the Thyrophoria. Thyrophora are nothing but your armored dinosaurs. So like your ankylosaurs and your stegosaurs, these are Thyrophorans. They had armored protection in order to defend themselves or for uh, sexual display or the different hypotheses that have been put forward. Then there is another group called the serapods. Serapods include two major divisions. You've got the ornithopods on one end, which are nothing but the duck-billed dinosaurs, or as we call them, the hadrosaurs. Then you've got another group called marginocephalia. Actually, this blue square should have included the pachycephalosauria as well, because they are part of the serapods. So marginocephalia, in turn, are divided into ceratopsia, which includes triceratops and all the dinosaurs with horns. And it includes the dome-headed dinosaurs called pachycephalosaurs. And finally, sorischia is just divided into two main groups, the long-necked dinosaurs or the sauropods and all your meat-eating dinosaurs or the theropods. Remember, all the meat-eating dinosaurs are theropods, but all theropods are not meat-eating dinosaurs. There were a few groups which may have been herbivorous to omnivorous as well. Now, hip to be a dinosaur. This is not a typo, by the way. This is actually what I want to explain over here. Like I said, the main differences between the two groups of dinosaurs, ornithischians and saurischians, is on the basis of the hip. As you can see, the pubis, in the case of the lizard-hipped or the saurischian dinosaurs, points forward. The ischium is in the opposite direction. In the case of the ornithischians, a part of the pubis points forward, but most of it is pointing backwards and lying parallel to the ischium. So this is the traditional classification of dinosaurs, and till date, it holds valid. Although some recent analyses conducted in 2018 have challenged this hypothesis, but enough evidence is not there in its favor to actually consider that hypothesis to be valid, because of which we are still sticking to our conventional uh, definition of the distinction between dinosaurs. So saurischians basically include, like I said, two groups, your meat eaters, you're seeing one on the screen in front of you, and the long, uh, the long necked sauropod dinosaurs. So suborder theropods, theropods, like I was saying, it includes all the carnivorous dinosaurs, but not all, but not all theropods were carnivores. You have got the T-Rex over here, which was pretty much a carnivore. We all know that. We all know T-Rex was a carnivore. But then you had this dinosaur. This is called a Therizinosaur. Therizinosaurus, just look at its arms. It was really, really weird. And one might have thought that this was probably some sort of a carnivorous dinosaur, but no, the arms, the long claws and the long uh, metacarpals and the finger bones were actually probably used for defense and for, you know, like acquiring food and acquiring plants and stuff from the trees because its dentition clearly shows that it was a herbivore. And Saurischia also includes birds. Like I said, birds are avian theropods. The Maniraptorian group that I was talking of earlier, from which birds have evolved, were one of the subdivisions of the theropods. Maniraptors are actually very, very closely related to the Tyrannosaurs. So the group to which T. rex belongs is called Tyrannosauroidea. It's a superfamily. And Tyrannosauroidea, along with some very small dinosaurs called Compsognathids and Maniraptors together, they form one higher group called the Coelurosaurs. So the coelurosaurs eventually gave rise to your maniraptors. Maniraptors in turn gave rise to your birds after passing through some intermediate stages. Now, I want to talk a little bit, just this one slide worth of a topic on Tyrannosaurus biology, although it's a topic that can be covered like in an entire lecture altogether. But why am I mentioning it is because T-Rex is a very popular dinosaur. People are very familiar with what a T-Rex is and how it looked like and everything. And as a result, more and more people are getting interested in learning about T-Rex. As a result, people do more research and a knowledge about T-Rex increases exponentially relative to the other dinosaurs because of which we do know a lot about T-Rex than we know about all the other groups of dinosaurs. So T-Rex had a large head. It had a very, very powerful bite force. The diagrams that you are seeing at the bottom are diagrams, uh, are diagrams of certain analyses, certain biomechanical studies that were conducted to measure the bite force of a T-Rex. And it was found that the mode in which T-Rex attacked was more like that of a lion or a mammalian carnivore. It was not like a crocodile. A crocodile will grab its prey and then if will move its head from side to side you know, until the prey actually gets suffocated and dies. But a T-Rex's force was a chomping force. It was a biting force. 
And this is nothing but fossilized poop or coprolite, as we call them, fossilized dung. And the fossilized dung of a T-Rex has actually shown that it has digested bone material, means T-Rex not just ate the flesh, it could even chew and digest the bones. So it was indeed a carnivore. I mean, it was a carnivore, it was an active predator. And whether it was a walker or a runner, well, that's dependent on what kind of studies you do. And I'll come back to the biomechanical studies uh, later on, like towards the end. And this is Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus is the biggest meat-eating dinosaur that we know today. Spinosaurus has rewritten history several times. Spinosaurus fossils were found way before the T-Rex actually. But at that time, it was just some partial skeleton that was found and people thought that, okay, it's a carnivorous dinosaur, but nowhere near T-Rex. Then later on, they found that Spinosaurus was not just bigger than T-Rex, it was also bigger than another dinosaur, which was considered bigger than T-Rex, that's Giganotosaurus. Spinosaurus was the top in terms of being the largest carnivorous dinosaur ever. Recently, Spinosaurus has rewritten history by changing the entire definition of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, until the time we found this thing about Spinosaurus, dinosaurs were considered strictly terrestrial animals. Spinosaurus recently has shown that it was an obligate, I'm sorry, it was a facultative aquatic animal. So for a considerable portion of its life, it would swim in the water, it would stay in the water, it was aquatic in its lifestyle, it was not strictly terrestrial. And how do we know this? As more and more complete skeletons have been found, we realized that the thigh bone and the overall leg bone of the Spinosaurus was very short. It was not to the exact height that was once estimated based on incomplete uh, fossils, but when the complete skeletons or relatively complete bones were found, we found that the leg bones were really, really small compared to what we had previously thought. They were almost in line with your forearms. And here, the definition of what a theropod is also changes because until this time, we knew theropods to be animals wherein the hind limbs were really long and the forelimbs were very short. You know, just imagine a T-Rex, hind limbs are really long the forelimbs are really short, but Spinosaurus actually changes that. If the forelimbs and the hind limbs were subequal in length, then the definition of a theropod also changes because it means that certain groups of theropods could actually at times walk on all fours. Spinosaurus was one of them. And this is just one of uh, one diagram that I have shown to compare the posture of Spinosaurus as what we once thought it was and how we know it to be today. The above diagram is a tooth of a Spinosaurus. Certain geochemical analyses have been conducted. It, it's called oxygen isotope analyses. And they show, they confirm the fact that Spinosaurus was piscivorous in its uh, dietary style, which, is, which means it ate fish. So it was aquatic to a considerable extent. Finally, we come to Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is uh, considered as a transitional link between um, dinosaurs and birds, between reptiles and birds in general, because it has got the body of a reptile. It has got a long bony tail. It's got, uh, what do you say, teeth in its jaws and all other reptilian characteristics. But at the same time, as you can see in the diagram over here, as marked by these arrows, it's got feathers as well. The feathers have been beautifully preserved as impressions. This was actually uh, preserved under very, very exceptional conditions in what we call a lagerstatin. These are those particular sedimentary facies wherein you have exceptional uh, quality of preservation because they're very, very fine mud. So uh, yes, so when Archaeopteryx was found, the happiest person on earth was actually Thomas Henry Huxley. He was, uh, well, he gave himself a self-proclaimed title called the Bulldog of Charles Darwin because he was an advocate of Darwin's theory of evolution. So he utilized Archaeopteryx. Initially, he was against it, but later on, he wholeheartedly embraced Archaeopteryx as the missing link, the so-called transitional form that all the other scientists at that time were demanding of Darwin. They were asking Darwin, okay, if life has gone through all these different stages, where are the intermediate forms? Huxley eventually said, here it is. This is one such example. And in honor of Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, we have even named, like uh, scientists much later on, have even named uh, another dinosaur, dino bird called Enchiornis Huxley. Uh, the, the species name Huxley is in honor of um, Thomas Henry Huxley. It may or may not be a bird, as we shall see, as we get more towards the bird line within the dinosaurs, the 
line of demarcation between what exactly is a dinosaur and what exactly is a bird gets blurred. The line almost dissolves completely. There comes a point wherein you don't know whether this animal is a dinosaur or it's a bird or it's both. So Archaeopteryx has certain, like I said, reptilian relationships. So it's got bony teeth, it's got interdental plates. That is nothing but projections of bones in between the teeth, which reptiles have. And of course, it's got a long tail as well. Birds have a very condensed version of a tail, which we call the pigostyle. And it's got a furcula. Now you will say furcula is a bird-like character. Why am I mentioning it in the Archaeopteryx dinosaur relationship? Well, certain non-avian dinosaurs, like non-flying dinosaurs, also had wishbone, also had the furcula. And what are the bird relationships of Archaeopteryx? We all know they had, first of all, they had feathers and wings. The feathers, the, the feathers of the wings were asymmetrical. And when I say asymmetrical, it means that, like, for example, if you have a feather in front of you, there is a line that runs through the middle of the feather. It's called the main axis. Then you've got the leading edge on one side and the trailing edge on the other side. In the case of flying birds, the leading and trailing edges are asymmetrical. One is bigger, one is shorter. And this is very important in order to generate the lift necessary to lift the bird off the ground. In birds that cannot fly, which we call ratites, the, the, the two ends of the feathers are symmetrical. But Archaeopteryx, upon closer examination, has shown us that it had asymmetrical feathers. It also had a decently sized chest area for the accommodation of flight muscles. It did not have very well developed flight muscles because of which we do figure today that it might have had some sort of difficulty in flying. It may not have been a continuous flyer, but at least based on the area of the flight muscles that were present in the chest or the breastbone region of Archaeopteryx, we do know that it was to a certain extent capable of active powered flight. So, like I said, as we move more towards the bird line, the distinction becomes less and less clear as to what's a dinosaur and what's a bird. So what is a bird? I can say a bird is something that has got feathers, but hey, some of the non-flying dinosaurs also sported feathers and feathers actually evolved from some very rudimentary or primitive structures, which were filamentous. We call them proto feathers. Then I will say that, well, birds are something that have got the true feathers. Birds are not something that have got proto feathers. And I will say, okay, but then we also have evidence of dinosaurs, like non-flying dinosaurs, which had first true feathers. They did not have a, a large enough surface area for the accommodation of flight muscles, meaning they could not fly, but they still had feathers. So this raises the question, were feathers actually evolved for flying or were they evolved for something else? Today, as we know it, or today, as most scientists accept, feathers were basically used for thermoregulatory purposes, that is to keep the body warm. And then finally, we come to the point wherein we say that birds are those particular animals that were capable of powered flight. But then I can say, then I can point to Archaeopteryx and say that Archaeopteryx showed you pretty much all these reptilian characters, right? So, and we also know based on, like I said, based on the chest muscle area, that it was up to a certain extent capable of powered flight. So what exactly is a bird? So then we finally have to succumb or finally have to surrender to the fact that birds are avian dinosaurs rather than trying to define exactly what a bird is and trying to separate it from the dinosaurs. We come to this final conclusion, this final verdict, that birds are avian dinosaurs. And the other dinosaurs which could not fly, we just call them non-avian dinosaurs at the moment. So if anyone tells you that the dinosaurs go extinct, you say, yes, they did. The non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. The avian ones are still around with us today. So if anybody asks you, what's the age range of the dinosaurs? You say that, well, they made their debut in the Triassic. That's, you know, in the late upper part of the Triassic. And they're still continuing to live with us today. So Mesozoic dash present, that's the age range of modern day dinosaurs or dinosaurs in general. Then we come to the other group of saurischians. These are the sauropodomorphs or the long-necked dinosaurs. These were some of the biggest animals of all times. The largest terrestrial animals were these sauropods. From current consensus, it depends on uh, which particular research paper you're referring, but in general, dinosaurs like Patagotitan Myorum of Patagonia is considered to be the biggest terrestrial animal to have ever walked on this planet. The thing about sauropods is that they, they were big, but still they are not as big or heavy as your modern day blue whale. Your blue whale can grow up to something like 180 tons. 
but a sauropod dinosaur would go grow up to 50 to 100 tons and while 50 to 100 tons is a lot it's not as much as a blue whale why is that because when you're in the water you don't have to worry so much about your weight because the upward force or the force that balances against the gravity is actually provided by the buoyancy of water on land that's not the case on land, gravity acts on you. And that means the heavier you are, the more difficult it is for you to move around. So what was the solution that evolution sought in these animals? Their bones were very light. Like the pterosaurs, their bones were also traversed by air sacs, just like your birds are birds as well, as we shall see. So their bones were traversed by all these air sacs. These air sacs made their bones more light. So we call these bones pneumatic bones or light bones. At the same time, they also aided them in an efficient respiration. Birds have got a very, very peculiar style of respiring. They've got a one-way flow of respiration, wherein the air that is actually breathed in passes through these air sacs. And also, birds have to be metabolically active. They need to fly and they need to expend a lot of energy. So heat dissipation also takes place through these holes in the bones. Sauropods had a similar strategy. And also sauropods were huge animals. As your volume increases, your surface area decreases. Volume and surface area has got an inverse relationship with each other. So if your volume, if you're going on eating and becoming big and big and big, your surface area decreases. If your surface area decreases, all that heat that your body is generating from inside gets stored. There comes a point when your volume is so big and surface area so small that your body just gets overheated and you will die. So in order to dissipate that heat, you need, you need some form of uh, alternative strategy to dissipate that heat. And the trabeculae or the holes in the bones provided one such strategy. The biggest sauropods probably are pretty much in Australia. So this is the western part of Australia. This is actually a region called Broome. And Broome locality, as you can see, this particular image over here has produced this sauropod footprint, which might just be the footprint of the biggest animal ever, know, uh, ever known. However, this is just a trace fossil. It's just a footprint. We don't have any body fossil or a skeleton uh, to compare it with, because of which we can't be that sure, because our estimates can be wrong because sometimes the foot is relatively more big compared to what you would expect a normal foot to be. Just imagine polar bears, for example, their feet are massive. If you were to have just a footprint of a polar bear, and if you were told to reconstruct the animal, you would probably reconstruct an animal which was twice or thrice as big as a polar bear than a normal polar bear. So footprints are not the exact or the best of options for recreating size, but what this tells us is that there were some colossal sauropods even in Australia and maybe bigger than anything else known on the planet. And I'll quickly just go through the other branch that is the ornithischian dinosaurs. You've got ornithopods. These were uh, hadrosaurs or duck-billed dinosaurs and they are distinguished on the basis of the shapes of the crests. Some of them didn't have any crests. Then we had the dome-shaped or the dome-headed pachycephalosaurs. We all know ceratopsians, triceratops being everybody's favorite. I hope so. Then we've got ankylosauria or the dinosaurs with an armored body and a clubbed tail. So there were two groups of ankylosaurs, one with a club tail, like this one, we call them family ankylosaurids. The other one without a club tail, we call them family nodosaurids. Apart from other skeletal differences, this is one primary uh, way of differentiating between the two families. Then you've got stegosaurs, which were the plated dinosaurs. And the doom of the non-avian dinosaurs, they went extinct. Yes, the non-avian dinosaurs, every last one of them has gone extinct, along with your pterosaurs, which are, by the way, sister tags onto the dinosaurs, along with the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, which were a completely different group that have get, left no living descendants. All these animals went extinct at the KT boundary or the Cretaceous tertiary boundary at 66 million years ago. And apart from these vertebrates, invertebrates also suffered extinction. Almost 50% of invertebrates went extinct almost 50%. I think it is uh, the overall value is less than that, but roughly around 50% went extinct. So you had uh, the loss of lots of bivalves like clams, snails, ammonoids, cephalopods, ammonoids went extinct, even marine planktons went extinct, and echinoids, which uh, belong to your echinodermata, they too went extinct. Echinodermata is the same group to which your starfish and brittle star belong. And also, a lot of different corals went extinct. One particular group of coral that had established itself by then is called the scleractinian corals. There are three types of corals, rugose, tabulates, and scleractinians. 
Rugose and tabulates were already extinct, almost on the verge of extinction by this time. But scleractinian corals, the corals which you still find today, a lot of their families and orders had gone extinct towards the end of the Cretaceous period. 80% of marine taxa, oh, so I was actually wrong, I said 50%. 80% of marine taxa, approximately the same, that's 80% terrestrial, went extinct. However, just one thing that I would like to point out over here is that despite the fact that so many species of animals actually went extinct, the dinosaur extinction was not the worst extinction of all times. It was the end Permian extinction, which took place before the dinosaurs, which was the mother of all mass extinctions. And what are the extinction contenders? Well, some people say that the extinction took place at a very slow rate, that before the boundary was reached at 66 million years ago, the diversity of dinosaurs was already on the decline because of climate change and other factors. Some people say that, no, it was a catastrophe. And there are two kinds of catastrophic models that have been put forward. One is the volcanological model, which is obviously based on the Deccan traps of India. And the other one is the catastrophic model of the asteroid, the asteroid impact. And actually we have strong evidence for both of them. We have strong evidence for the fact that yes, the Deccan trap basalts were also around at the same boundary. And the fact that the iridium layer, which has been found that which has been found between the Cretaceous and tertiary periods. Remember, iridium is something that is found in very rare quantities in Earth, but in an extraterrestrial body like an asteroid, an iridium would be present in higher amounts. So the iridium spike that the graph actually shows leads or confirms to the conclusion that yes, there was some sort of an extraterrestrial impact. And recently, or recently as in a few decades ago, the crater or the impact site was actually found as well. It is somewhere near Mexico in the Chicxulub region, specifically called the Yucatan Peninsula. And these are just, like I was saying, I'll also talk very briefly about how to bring dinosaurs back to life. I know I'm not talking of the science fiction ways, I'm talking of actual science that we do. So this diagram that you are seeing over here, oops, sorry, is called FEA, finite element analyses. This is one such method that we use in order to uh, kind of, um, what you say, in order to build models that talk about the biomechanics of dinosaurs. Like for example, in order to determine how strong a bite force was or which regions of the skull underwent greater stress or lesser stress, we use finite element analyses. Then we use something called EPB or the extant phylogenetic bracket. So dinosaurs are extinct, non-avian dinosaurs are extinct. So which are the closest re living uh, relatives that we know of dinosaurs? One's of course crocodiles, which are distinctly related. And one is more derived dinosaurs, that is birds. So using crocodiles and birds as models, we kind of reconstruct some soft tissue anatomy like the musculature in the case of dinosaurs. So that is one thing we do. We also do biomechanics wherein we build 3D models or simulations of these models in computers to see how dinosaurs moved and how their locomotory patterns were and so on and so forth. And also what we do is Science, like I was saying, if you uh, recall my initial talk about the Edward Drinker Cope, Othniel Charles Marsh uh, feud, what we do is accept constructive criticism. There was a time when this so-called juvenile, which is actually considered a different species called Dracorex, it was, it was thought that these three were completely different species. So Dracorex over here and Pachycephalosaurus over here, they were two completely different species. Today we do know that, well, Probably Dracorex was just the juvenile version of the adult Pachycephalosaurus. We have histological or bone evidence or uh, thin sections of the bone evidence to support that hypothesis. And these are just some recent advancements that have been made. This is the so-called famous dino mummy. This was one of those first finds where fossilized skin was found. And when I say fossilized skin, not just impressions, but actual fossilized skin, when they conducted certain analyses like FTIR or Fourier transformed infrared mass spectrometry, they actually found the breakdown products of proteins, which actually went to show that under exceptional conditions of preservation, you can have skin that is fossilized over here. Then today, we also know with certainty the color of certain dinosaurs. We have fossilized pigment cells called melanosomes based on the shape of the melanosomes, whether they are rod shaped or circular shaped, that is whether they are eumelanosomes or phacomelanosomes, we can accurately say what color the dinosaur may have been because all we need to do is just compare those melanosomes with that of birds. And you can actually see 
And this, we also know the color of certain eggs of dinosaurs. Again, these are just some birds, bird eggs for reference. And there are two kind of, um, kinds of uh, pigments that get preserved in this case, protoporphyrin and biliviridin. So these two pigments, if they are preserved, again, just look at their morphology and everything, and just compare it with birds, protoporphyrin and biliviridin of dinosaurs and birds. And finally, this is what I call the game changer dinosaur. This is Ichi. First of all, it holds the record for having the shortest generic name, just two letters in the word, uh, in the genus, that is YI. And why is it a game changer? Why do I say it's a game changer? Because this dinosaur does not have the normal winged pattern that you would find in other theropod dinosaurs. It has got a bat-like wing, just like your pterosaurs and bats. And we do know that it was capable up to a certain extent of active powered flight. So it was literally a flying bat like dinosaur. And this, it, is, it has been very difficult to put it in its right phylogenetic context. Only recently have we been able to do it. And these are just some other, other, other stuff that people have done over the years in dinosaurs. They've taken CT scans of the brain. CT scans, the one advantage of a CT scan is that you don't have to break the fossil anymore. CT scans will just, you know, penetrate inside and just take uh, different slices, which in a computer, in a software can, all, can then be combined into a 3D model. And you can get the internal brain casts or brain scans of these dinosaurs. And that shows that some dinosaurs, like these uh, hadrosaurs, for example, they had uh, those particular regions of the brain that are uh, that are useful for interpreting social cues were very large, larger than 40%, indicating that they were good at social behavior. And of course, we also have looked at histological sections or thin sections of the bone, wherein we have found this thing called LAG or lines of arrested growth. There was a time when people would say that, hey, Dinosaur bones have got a line of arrested growth. It's just like reptiles, so they were cold-blooded. But today we do know that the pattern in which the LAGs are laid out in the dinosaur bones are more similar to the pattern of LAGs found in mammals and birds than in the reptiles, indicating that possibly at least some dinosaurs were completely endothermic or warm-blooded. And some dinosaurs, like I was saying, the sauropods, at some point in their life may have been warm-blooded. And as they grew big, they might have become ectothermic or like relying on external temperature. And Brontosaurus, this is one final thing that I would like to talk about, bring back the Brontosaurus. Yes, Brontosaurus is back. So for those of you who don't know the story of Brontosaurus, Othniel Charles Marsh was the first one to actually describe Brontosaurus in 1879. But then people found that, no, wait, the, it's not exactly a different species. It is similar to another dinosaur, which Othniel Charles Marsh himself had described two years earlier in 1877 called Apatosaurus. So for a very long time, Brontosaurus was synonymized with Apatosaurus. And then people realized again, and this is just in 2015, that people realized that no, wait, Marsh was right. The, 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 the very reasons why he considered Brontosaurus to be different from Apatosaurus may not be that valid today. But if you actually look at other differences, the two of them are indeed different. So again, this is a case of constructive criticism, which has been accepted by the dinosaur community as time has progressed. And finally, thank you very much for being such a patient audience. Thank you, sir. Yeah, great Vikram. It was really very interesting and very insightful presentation from your side. Thank you, sir. sir. Uh, so you are requested to type your questions in chat box and Vikram, there are already some questions. So uh, uh, sir, I should I stop uh, sharing my screen? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Okay. If uh, you require to go back to any of your slides. Okay, I'll do that. So I'll just you can keep it, it like this. Okay, okay. So I'll just open the chat. Okay. So Jaydeep has asked about the differences in eggs of pterosaur and dinosaurs. Differences in the eggs. Okay, so the basic differences in the eggs of pterosaurs and dinosaurs are in uh, the outer calcium, what you say, the, the, the shell region. So pterosaurs have got a very kind, from what we do know at the moment, they have very thin shells compared to dinosaurs. And also the morphology and the overall shape is something that you must consider. Uh, certain dinosaurs, uh, especially your ornithopods and what you say, the bird line dinosaurs laid really, really large eggs. Sauropods, on the other hand, 
despite being very big in size, laid relatively small eggs. So morphology is one such thing. And as far as the pterosaur eggs are concerned, we don't have enough material of the pterosaurs to actually talk much about them, but we do know certain differences in the histology and the overall morphology of those eggs, and even the shape and stuff, which comes in a morphology. And I see there is another question. Um, Kangaroo. kangaroo and marsupials look like T-Rex is because of evolutionary adaptation after spring. Kangaroo and some marsupials look like T-Rex. Well, uh, evolutionary adaptation, no. If, if there is some similarity between kangaroos and marsupials, it depends on what kinds of similarities you're talking of. But if there is similarities between such distant groups, I would say it's a result of convergence rather than any shared ancestry. It's just like looking at a whale and uh, uh, what do you say, a whale or a dolphin, which are mammals, and looking at something like fish or an ichthyosaur, which is a reptile. And fish is a completely different group altogether. So all three look similar. They have what you say, a uh, streamlined body and fins and everything, but they don't share a common ancestor. Like, okay, if you go further, 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 further back in time, eventually they will share some common ancestor, but otherwise they are completely different. They are independently originated from each other. So. I would say that would be a result of convergence. But again, it depends on what characters you're referring to, because some characters may have occurred way earlier back in the earliest amniote, which may have been acquired by all the groups and other characters may have developed independently. And then Jaydeep also said the Alvarez hypothesis. I, I think it was his exclamation when you yeah. were talking about the. Yes. Okay. okay. Let's okay. go and to. Okay, why we don't find any dinosaur fossils in India? Uh, well, that is uh, not correct at all. There are so many dinosaur fossils found in India. There, for example, the best known is Rajasaurus narmadensis from the Narmada Valley. It is found in Balasinor. It was found in the early 2000s by Dr. Ashok Sani, Professor Jeffrey Wilson, and Dr. Paul Serino. It was like a whole group of paleontologists who had come together to Balasinor in Gujarat and excavated that dinosaur. We've got Indosuchus. We've got so many dinosaurs or nesting sites in India, which means the egg sites and everything. So India is very, very rich in dinosaur fossils, actually. The thing is that the appreciation for those dinosaur fossils is more abroad than in India itself. And that is something that uh, kind of like gets to my heart at times, that the very appreciation for dinosaur fossils, which are so diverse in India, people don't seem to recognize or acknowledge them. But Everywhere else in the world, if you open any dinosaur book, a detailed dinosaur study book, you will always have a section on the dinosaurs of India, especially the Abelisaurids and the Carcharodontosaurids. They are just a group of theropod dinosaurs, by the way. Can we infer anything about gravity in parts of the earth? Um, well, gravity is a, a very tricky topic to, to talk about uh, in paleontology, but to a certain extent, you can talk about the orbital movements of the earth and that up to a certain extent may have influenced some sort of seasonality and stuff. That is something that we can hypothesize about. Otherwise, when it comes down to gravity, it is more of an astrophysics related thing than paleontology, I would say. And what can we learn about climate change from the times of dinosaurs to counter the problem today? Uh, who said that? I think that's Abhishek. And Abhishek, that's a wonderful question. That is pretty much what we as paleontologists are trying to do, not just with dinosaurs, not just with dinosaurs in general, but, uh, but I mean, not just with dinosaurs in particular, but also fossils in general. For example, right now for my PhD, I'm actually looking at small mammalian bones. I'm looking at small mammalians like some uh, marsupials and even some placentals like some extinct fossil rats and I'm trying to determine based on their diversity and stuff what their habitat was and how that habitat has changed over time and what were the you know tr factors or the triggers that were responsible for such changes and when exactly that extinction event or the turnover event as we say took place so that's a very good question the bones themselves uh, like climate change itself will tell you just the facts, the way they are, like, for example, okay, at this particular boundary, this happened, but the interpretation of it depends or varies from fossil to fossil or the assemblage you're studying. Remember, in such hypotheses, before just being bold and stating your hypotheses, you should also consider all the biases inherent. So everything needs to be accounted for. And uh, why did birds evolve ornithischian hip structure despite being sorostian? Good question. Uh, enough birds did not uh, de de derive the ornithischian hip structure 
technically birds derive the bird hip structure, I would say. The ornithischians are the bird hip dinosaurs. Okay, so the thing is, why it happened is a question that has not been answered because why, why something happens in evolution, it's always a bit of a mystery. But how we know that birds are what you say uh, derived from saurischians and not from ornithischians, like I said, it's to do with embryology. So if you look at the embryo of a bird, a developing embryo, very, very tiny, you will actually see that the pubis is pointing forwards, just like in the case of saurischian dinosaurs. Now, as the bird is passing through different ontogenetic stages, that is, as the bird is turning into an adult, that pubis actually goes behind. It goes behind and becomes retroverted to lie parallel to the ischium. So we do know how it has happened and why. Well, if I'm to give you a vague answer for it, which might be true or might not be, it might just be a mutation which got favored because evolution always takes place because of uh, a combination of the environmental factors, the mutation, the drift, and also the recombination of different facts, uh, like uh, you know the, the different parts of the genes and chromosomes. So maybe it was one of those mutations that wasn't deleterious in nature. It was one that was favored by natural selection. So yes, that was one thing. And uh, what's, your <laughs> what's my favorite dinosaur? To be honest, I don't have a favorite dinosaur. Uh, for me, each and every dinosaur is my favorite. I don't tend to distinguish between them. Uh, there are some dinosaurs that intrigue me more than others, in which case I would say there is one particular group of dinosaur which is related to your Spinosaurus. It comes under the same group called Spinosaurids. And the name is literally called Irritator. Why? Because for a very long time, the bones of that dinosaur actually puzzled scientists to an extent that they couldn't figure out what these bones were of. To which animal does it belong? Where does this dinosaur fit? So they just called it Irritator. And by the time they figure out it was a Spinosaurid, Irritator had already become the you know, formal name. And once you have actually named a species, you can't change it unless you have a reason to do so, unless you know that that particular species name has already been taken by something else or that it is actually a specimen belonging to a previously established species. So, uh, until, so un until then you can't exactly change the name. So according to the rules of ICZN or the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, um, Irritator was already a valid taxon by the time the scientists figured out where in the phylogeny it fit. And, uh, I think, was there any climatic restrictions about existence of um, uh, dinosaurs? Uh, what exactly do you mean by that, Rajani? I didn't quite understand that. Was there any climatic restrictions about existence of dinosaurs, Mrs. Sohini? I, I want to mean that uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were existed only in a certain kind of uh, climatic belt, uh, mm -hmm. where they existed only in a certain kind of climatic belt. Oh, okay. That's a very good question. Uh, the answer to that again would be no. Dinosaurs existed literally everywhere. Just, just uh, recently, we also had the first few published reports of dinosaurs and other extinct reptiles in Antarctic. So at that time, yes, Antarctic was pretty much uh, different in its position. It, it was not typically at the poles, at least not in the early Triassic, because Pangaea was still intact. All the supercontinents were joined together in Pangaea, and Pangaea was still just beginning to drift apart, right? Right? So at that time, even though the continents were beginning to drift apart and stuff, dinosaurs were found literally everywhere. There's even a place where the landmass actually broke away from the rest of the continent. And as a result, evolution on that island took place in isolation. It's called Transylvania. That's really a place. And you might know Transylvania from the fictional character of Dracula. But Transylvania is really a place wherein dinosaurs have actually evolved in isolation. And the most... <clears throat> Sorry, interesting part about the Transylvanian dinosaurs is that the sauropods, that is the long neck dinosaurs, are very, very small in size compared to the sauropods from the rest of the world. Now, a lot of hypotheses has been put forward for that. One of them being that there was no competition from other animals. There was no competition from predators or anything of the sort. Everything was pretty much self-contained. So evolution took place in isolation. So dinosaurs were pretty much ubiquitous. They were everywhere. Oh. And... If we study Permian extinction in detail, can we do a prediction of change in evolutionary history and evolutionary can then be changed? Permian extinction actually has been studied in detail. It has been, uh, <clears throat> I would suggest one particular book. It is called When Life Nearly Died by Michael J. Benton. It is one of the most comprehensive but 
definitely not up to date because recent research has uh, added a lot of information. But at, uh, in terms of a popular science book, it is one of the most up to date accounts of the Permian extinction. And uh, no, we, we do have enough information to show that the evolutionary tree or anything might not change because we do have a representative sample of all the faunas that basically lived. I won't say all the faunas, but the major faunas that were alive, we do have a representative samples of that because everywhere, in, uh, everywhere in throughout the world, those same kinds of faunas have been discovered. So during the Permian, you had the ancestors of mammals, the mammal-like reptiles or proto-mammals as we call, they were dominant during that time. Specific groups of these proto-mammals were like dicynodonts and cynodonts, gorgonopsids, dinocephalians, and so on and so forth. These were all proto-mammals. So we do have representatives of each of these or almost each of these from many different parts of the world. So yes, while the new fossil finds might add to our existing knowledge, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to turn the tree upside down. But then you never know. Every time you think that something is going to be stable, something or the other changes. So you might just be right. <clears throat> As Jurassic Park movie, is it good question, uh, Sumitha. Uh, well, <clears throat> according to our present knowledge, no, the answer is no, because uh, DNA does not survive 66 million years of extinction. Uh, some reports you will see, especially by a team of researchers led by a very famous lady, a very famous uh, female paleontologist called Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who has shown that it is possible for certain breakdown products of DNA to survive the fossil record. So 66 million years and DNA might have got broken down, broken down, broken down. But instead of getting completely, you know, uh, disintegrated, ex exceptional conditions of preservation may have preserved those breakdown products. So yes, while the breakdown products may be preserved, they are just very tiny, tiny fragments. So reconstructing an entire like dinosaur, like DNA, um, so far it's, it's like literally science fiction for the moment. So I think those are all the questions, sir. Yeah, great. So I think questions are over. Okay. It was a really nice talk. And okay, sir. Uh, should I stop sharing my screen, sir? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Vartak, sir. Okay. No, no, he has given really means. Good. Yeah. Okay. So here we conclude. Uh, I thank you, Vikram, for thank you a really uh, interesting talk. Yeah, very insightful talk. And we really appreciate and the hard work what you have put. Yeah, it is evident in the presentation and talk what you have presented here so really nice to uh, have such a session and i uh, thank all the audience for attending this tomorrow it is the fifth day of the series and the talk will be delivered by dr sridhar ayer on marine minerals with reference to placer deposits of maharashtra so everyone is invited for the talk on same link shared on uh, shared for Google, uh, sorry, Zoom meet. So yeah, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit, sir. Yes, yeah.